If you would turn with me in the Scriptures to Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 18. Now Matthew 18 is real interesting because many times when somebody says, turn to Matthew 18, uh, at least I think, now, now I don't know if everybody thinks this, but I immediately think about church discipline. Because this is where you find the real clear teaching about church discipline from verses 15 to 20 in chapter 18. But that's not what we're talking about tonight. So you can breathe a sigh of relief. We're not talking about church discipline. But here's what we are talking about. In the, in the light of our Sunday morning study of Philemon, Philemon's all about, it's a short short letter but it's all about forgiveness and so tonight i thought it'd be helpful for us to go to matthew 18 and look at what jesus taught the disciples about forgiveness so we're going to be starting in verse 21 and going to the end of chapter 18 now before i read the scriptures i want to i want to give you a a little quote from c.s lewis c.s lewis said Everyone thinks forgiveness to be a lovely idea until they have something to forgive. It sounds so wonderful. Yes, we ought to forgive one another. Absolutely. That's real Christian. Well, and then when somebody does us wrong, and then it's up to us to offer forgiveness, then it's not so lovely of an idea. It's a little bit more challenging, right? It's a little more challenging. So let's look at the scriptures and uh, we'll see in Matthew 18 what Jesus has to say beginning in verse 21. Here's what the Bible says. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seventy times seven. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he had begun to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. But since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had and repayment to be made. So the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. The Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And he seized him and began to choke him, saying, Pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you. But he was unwilling. And he went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what was owed. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his Lord, moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. Lord, your word is before us. I pray you give us understanding and then that you would prompt our obedience for your glory and for our good. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, how many of you have read or heard that story before most everyone right so I don't think we'll plow any new 
in any new rows tonight, but I want us to review some things, maybe some details in the story that we may not realize the profound nature of what's happening. So, first of all, there's two verses about Peter and Jesus. And then Jesus spends the rest of the chapter teaching through this other story. Okay, So the first thing happens is Peter is trying to be self-righteous. He's trying to show himself to be a super spiritual man. And he says... Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Seven times? Now, the custom was three. You were required, expected in, in the Jewish custom. Three times. Somebody sins against you three times, you forgive them. After that, you turn them loose. Let them go. Well, so he doubled that plus one. Okay, so that's, what, that's Peter's mindset. Well, I know what the custom is. It's three. So I'm going to say seven to make myself sound like I'm, oh, wow. Everybody, all the other disciples would have said, you can forgive somebody seven times. Man, you're pretty patient, which Peter was not. So what does Jesus say? No, not seven times. Seventy times seven. So we all know, right, Jesus was not giving him a math problem, and he was not saying Okay, go figure out 70 times 7 is 490, so you keep a track, and as soon as you get 491, you're, you're, you're clear. You, you don't have to do it no more. Okay, that's not what he was saying. The intent in what Jesus told him was to say, there's no end to forgiveness for a Christian. Now, that's a terrible, terrible principle, isn't it? Y'all are all supposed to say, no, no, that's wonderful. That's what we are. That's a good Christian. No, it's terrible. Because we don't, that doesn't feel good. Right? There, there's times when we don't want to forgive people. And, and we pretty feel pretty justified in it too. I mean, if somebody ever does you wrong, treats you bad, and then does it again, and then does it again, and that's just how it's going to be, I'll just, I mean, let's just be honest, right? I'll be, I'll be honest. I don't want to forgive nobody like that. I don't want to. I'm supposed to. God calls me to do that. If, if, if I want to be like Him, if I'm, if I'm devoted to living a life that is patterned after Jesus, then that's what I'm supposed to do. Right? We can all agree on that, right? We, I mean, I'm not saying it feels good. I'm not saying you want to. I'm just saying we, we have to agree that's what we're supposed to do. Right? That's what the Bible says. So that's the principle. That's how Jesus answers Peter. So that's laid down there. For the, for the follower of Jesus, there's no end to forgiveness. Doesn't mean you have to agree. Doesn't mean you even have to like the person. It just means you're supposed to forgive it let it go. Okay? Don't hold a grudge. But then he launches into this story, and it's pretty extensive from verse 23 to the end of the chapter. But look how the story begins for this reason. So the principle that he has just defined for Peter and for the disciples, he says, take that truth. There's no end to forgiveness in the, for the follower of Jesus. That principle, for that reason... The kingdom, he said, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to this story. And then he launches into the story. Now, there's some, there's some important things. I'm not going to just belabor this because I know we've all read the story. We all know what's happening. The, the king had, uh, had a, a slave that owed him a ton of money. He couldn't pay it back. Then that slave went out and found somebody who owed him less money. And he would not forgive even though he had just been forgiven. That's the gist of it. But I want you to see some details the details to which Jesus goes to demonstrate the severity of what's happening. Okay, It's not just, well, he got forgiven, but then he wouldn't forgive. It's more than that. Okay, So let's look at the two scenarios. From verse 23 down to verse 27, you have the first 
part of the story. The king wanted to settle accounts, so he went to settle them. He found one who owed him 10,000 talents. Now, so here's the part where we've got to really get some detail. One talent was north of 15 years of a laborer's pay. Okay? So everybody understand what we're talking about. One talent is north of 15 years worth of pay. 10,000 talents is north of 150,000 years of pay. Alright, is everybody clear so far? That's a lot. Nobody lives to be 150,000 years old. But that's, what we're, that's the kind of money we're talking about here. That's what was owed. So let's, let's put it in real numbers. If you averaged $50,000 a year for 150,000 years, that would be $7.5 billion. That's a 7 and a comma and a 500 and a comma and six more zeros. So $7.5 billion. And this was more than that. Okay, because one talent is more, more than 15 years. All right, so you understand, that's how much this guy owed. He's never paying it back. He ain't got enough years in his life. He's ne it's never going to happen. So that's why that number was chosen. When Jesus tells this story, he could have chosen any, any amount. But he chose 10,000 talents as just like, that's just crazy. That's crazy money. There's no way, nobody could ever pay that. He could get all his family, all their relatives, and all the people they live in their, in their village and put all their money together for their whole lives. It's never going to be enough. So, he's, so here's the, the inference there. He's never getting out of jail. He's never paying off the debt. There's, he is 100% incapable of paying the debt. That's the point, okay? Now, I want you to start thinking with some spiritual, put your spiritual thinking cap on. Do you know of another debt like that that you are incapable of paying? No matter how long you live, no matter what you do, you can't ever pay it back. Okay? Now you start to see what we're talking about. And so what does he do? He throws himself on the mercy of the court, so to speak. He falls down. He pleads with the king. He says, please, and he uses these words, be patient. I'll pay it all back. Isn't that what he says? He didn't have the means to pay. He was going to have the man sold with his wife and his children and everything he had. Verse 26, the slave fell to the ground. Have patience with me, and I'll repay you everything. Well, guess what? That's a lie. There ain't enough patience in the world. The debt's too large. He cannot pay it back. Never. It's not, pay, not getting paid back. Okay? But what does the king do? Verse 27. The Lord of that slave felt compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. So that picture is Jesus. That's Jesus going to a cross and looking out at a, an entire world filled with people like that first slave that owe a debt that they will never be able to pay back no matter what they do. And He feels compassion for us. He releases us he frees us, right? And He wipes away the debt. That's the first half. Now, you see where this is going. What should be the reaction of that gentleman? How should he feel at that moment? What are some, what are some thoughts? What are some emotions you think he should be feeling? Relief, transformation, thankfulness, 
uh, maybe uh, just I, I can't believe what just happened. That, I mean, that's a life-changing moment. Right? And that, that's not a coincidence. So he ought to then be in a unique position, like one he's never been in in his whole life. He ought to be in a unique position to express compassion to other people because of what just happened to him. Right? That would make sense, wouldn't it? Verse 28. But, you know, that's not good. That slave went out, found one of his fellow slaves, who owed him a hundred denarii. Now, 10,000 talents. Remember what we said. One talent is north of 15 years worth of wages. 10,000 talents is up more than 150,000 years of wages. This fellow owed him a hundred denarii. One denarius, one denarius is one day of pay. So a hundred days of pay versus more than 150,000 years of pay. He just got forgiven this debt. Now this debt here, it's not insurmountable. It's still pretty hefty. I mean, you think about owing somebody whatever you would make if you divide your paycheck and divide it out into what you make a day. And you say a hundred days of that you owe somebody. That, that's no, that ain't just a drop in the bucket. I mean, you're talking about a third of a year's worth of pay. But it's not insurmountable. You know, it could happen. So let's see how he reacts. How does the the slave who owed him, how did he react? Oh, much like the first guy, right? It says in verse 29, he fell to the ground, began to plead with him, have patience with me. It's exactly what he said, right? Exactly the same. Verse 30, but he was unwilling. So he just got shown tremendous compassion and mercy and forgiveness and now it says he was unwilling so he went and threw this fella in prison until he should pay back everything that was owed now let me tell you this lest we forget the effects the far-reaching effects the first fella that got forgiven you know what the king was gonna do with him it wasn't just gonna be him it was gonna be him and his wife and his children, and all his possessions, everything he had was gone. It, it didn't just affect him. It affected his whole family. And this, this fellow then goes out, and he takes this man that owes him a far less sum, and he throws him in prison until he's going to pay back the debt. Now, what happens when you get thrown in prison? Is your earning potential the same? in prison as it is when you're out working? Well, of course not. So, it would have at least been better if he wasn't going to forgive him to say, all right, I'm going to, just like the government, I'm going to garnish your wages, I'm going to take, you know, I'm going to take this money, as you earn it, I'm going to take it and apply it to your debt till it's gone. But he didn't even do that. He threw him in jail. So now he can't work. Now he can't earn like he was. So now it's going to take him even longer to try to pay it back. Right? So, as we well know, whether you want it to happen or not, people tend to watch what happens in other people's lives. You don't believe me? Have you heard of this thing called social media? Uh, what is that? That's a bunch of people watching the lives of a bunch of other people, and it ain't even real. You're watching highlight reels. You're not watching real life. You know, just take a look at it. It's hardly ever anything bad. It's all, everybody's best day all the time. And that's all it is. So it's not even true. But people watch other people's lives. And, and guess what happened here? His fellow servants saw what happened. 
And what did they do? They felt compelled. You know, we probably ought to tell somebody about that because that wasn't right. So even the other slaves had a sense of morality enough to say, he just, he just won the lottery of forgiveness. And now he's not going to forgive this other guy? That's not right. And, and, and by the way, even in a broken, sinful world, I want you to, to, to make sure you remember, even people that don't believe in Jesus have within them some sense. Deep, it may be deep down, but they have some sense of right and wrong. You know why? Because God put it in their hearts when He created them. It's inescapable. They might read Romans 1. It might be suppressed way down. Suppress the truth. But it's not because they don't know. It's not because it's not there. They just may have suppressed it for so long that they, they just ignore it now. But everybody has a sense. When something wrong is happening, everybody on some level can look at it and say, you know, that, that's just not right. It's just a matter of whether or not you're going to do something about it. Right? And unfortunately, we live in a world now where fewer and fewer people are willing to stand up for what's right and do something. And that's a shame. But these fellow slaves, verse 31, they saw what happened. They were, look at it, they were deeply grieved. They saw the poor treatment, the lack of forgiveness. So they came and reported it to the king, everything that had happened. So then the king got involved again. He went to that slave and said, you, verse 32, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me, much in the same way this other fellow pleaded with him. And even the king said in verse 33, Shouldn't you also have had mercy on your fellow slave the same way I had mercy on you? So, so let me translate that. Oh man, this hurts my feelings. I don't even want to say this out loud. I just said it real quick in my head before I said it out loud. Now I don't want to say it. So i got to say it anyway. It's as if every time I don't forgive somebody, Jesus is standing behind me like this in disbelief. You mean to tell me after everything I did for you, all that I just forgave you for, and you're not going to forgive that person? And, and he's right. And I'm not. Every single time I attempt to not be forgiving to someone else, Jesus has every right to snatch me up and give me a little talking to and say, what, what are you doing? Don't you remember? Don't you remember that cross? Don't you remember what I did? Don't you remember that mountain of sin that has your name on it? And and I forgave that for you, but you're not going to forgive this much less of an offense in this person. How do you? How do you, you know, what do you have to say for yourself? It's almost that's what Jesus has said. What do you have to say for yourself? How can you possibly rationalize not forgiving someone when I did what I did? That's what, that's what Jesus is saying. So, verse 34. So the king, his Lord, moved with anger now. Not compassion. It's, he's, he's had a, a change of heart. Moved with anger, he handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed. And then the summary of the story, verse 35. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. Now, there's a few things that we need to just conclude with right here. Does Jesus hold your forgiveness like uh, over you, like uh, like every case by case? Like once you get saved, no, no. If you are, but listen, listen to what I'm about to say. This is really important. 
if you are genuinely converted by the blood of Christ, that you have repented of your sins and you have surrendered everything to Jesus and you have trusted fully in Him for forgiveness and salvation and eternal life. That's a big if. Because that's how you get saved. Repentance and faith and surrender. That's, that's salvation. Okay? If that's happened, then you're forgiven. Period. So, so this verse 35 is not saying, all right now... You Christians, you be now. He is talking to us, but he's not saying you're not forgiven if you don't. But he, here's what he is saying: You Christians, you need to be forgiven, people. So I, I can't write it. It's so much. I'm not going to say it as clearly as it is when you write it out. But try to understand the words I'm using. Forgiven people as in I have been forgiven. Forgiven people forgive people. That, that's what verse 35 means. This is, this is the practice of life. If I have been forgiven, then I forgive other people. That, that's what verse 35 means. It's not to say, well now if you don't forgive people, I'm not going to forgive you. Because he, he, you have to understand the nature of salvation. You are forgiven. If you're under the blood of Jesus, you are forgiven. Therefore, forgive. Forgive others. And, and, and how many, let's go back, how many times are we supposed to do that? Unlimited. Forever. There's no limit. There's no end. And, and that's the lesson. And, and we, man, we're going, this week, this Sunday... In Philemon, the next section, you're going to start to see why that's such a big deal. Uh, in the life of a church and a, and a person who was uh, not, a person who, I was going to say not in good uh, good spot, but a person who is at odds with the church and needs forgiveness. And now we're going to see why that's such a big deal. Forgiven people forgive people. That's just that's just how it is. All right. Let's pray.